Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Jim, and, and thank all of you for, for braving, which really not much bad weather. So <laughs> kind of out there, so it's not that bad. Thanks. But uh, you know, appreciate the invitation here to speak. There, there's two primary points I want to make, and then I guess I'm you know, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, you obviously mentioned my business background. Let, let me start with a story, and this really dates back almost two years ago. I had a breakfast event with. Uh, business roundtable and, and head of Boeing was the current chair and he stood up and, and welcomed everybody to breakfast and said, we're, hey, we're the business rounds, roundtable. We represent the largest corporations in America who, I mean, I realize we're probably not in really the state of the American public, but, but that's a conversation for another day. I was the first senator to stand up from my table and give my little talk and I, I went right to that comment. I said, we, we can't afford to have that be a conversation for another day. And I asked the rhetorical question, how, how do we get to a point in this country, in America, where business is viewed as evil? Where success is, you know, rather than it's celebrated, it's, it's demagogued against, it's, it's demonized. And politically it works. Well, yeah, I, I've got gray hair, I actually kind of lived through the process. I, I saw the radical left take over our university system uh, in the 60s. And so, so they totally control our university system. There, there's a few shiny ex uh, exceptions. But when you control our colleges of education, of journalism, of law, of economics, you pretty well control our culture. So the left has had a control in our culture for about 50 years, and it's showing. It really is. It's actually amazing that conservatism really survives at all. So what I asked the businesses of the Business Roundtable that day is, you know, first of all, recognize the fact that our, you know, our education system is not going to pr promote the, the concept of a free market competitive system. Uh, our news media won't. When's the last time you saw a, a movie celebrating the glories of business and the wonderful products and services that uh, this free market system produces? I mean, it just doesn't happen. So the defense of our free market system, I would say the, 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 the task of, of remarketing the very concept of America falls to us, to business people. And so as I travel around manufacturing plants in Wisconsin or anywhere in America, and I'm talking to business people and where I'm talking particularly to people who work with them, you know, I, I try and point out that business people have got to engage in the effort. They've got to be involved. They have to defend themselves. Business people have to talk to the people who work with them and explain the fact that working together, it's just vital that they succeed. People in business ever expect to get better pay, better benefits, better job security, better job opportunities? Those aren't going to come from a law that we write here in Washington. That's going to come through success of the organization. And, and oh, by the way, success in business is actually measured by something. It's called a profit. It's not evil. It's absolutely necessary. Now, again, in today's culture, after you know, 40, 50 years of just this onslaught of <coughs> demonizing businesses and you know, holding up the glories of a, of a government with all these wonderful intentions, that's a pretty heavy lift. But if businesses succeed in, in, in at least convincing the people to work with them, now, notice how I always use this word, work with. They need to take the next step. They, they've got to talk to the people who work with them about how important it is that their suppliers succeed, that their customers succeed. It's that this entire marvel that we call the American economy has to succeed. I mean, I, 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 I didn't have to admit that big oil and big pharma have to succeed. But am, am, I, am I the only one? Are we the only two that, that actually want <laughs> life-saving new drugs? I mean, am I the only guy that drives my gas tank down to 10 miles left on the, on the little gauge there, and I'm really glad there's a gas station at the next exit? So this isn't that hard a concept to grasp. But nobody is making the point. Nobody is. So it's got to be put up to business. So anyway, that's, that's, my, that's my appeal to business people and how we have to get them involved in this process across the board, across the country. It's just vital. It's the first thing businesses need to do. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how, how I bring a businessman's perspective to my new chairmanship. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any other committee that actually has a mission statement. I found that out in business pretty early, actually when we got bought out by a British company and I'd always kind of done the strategy in my head and they came to me with this big old strategic planning packet. You know, okay, you're going to do strategic planning. Oh, you know, <laughs> but then I started doing it. And, and there, you know, a lot of that was just you know, not necessary. But 
Yeah. Producing a mission vision statement was extremely important. As I went down and I, and I, I you know, kind of labored and thought about it and laid out what, what the mission vision statement was for, for my company Packer and what our values were, it was really, really healthy. <coughs> and so I've carried that along. That strategic planning process is something I'm, I'm actually uh, maybe despised for around here. You know, I, I am the sand of the oyster. Not only talking about a strategy, but a bicameral strategic planning process. But have, having understood the value of that, working with my ranking member, working with other members, we, we developed a pretty simple mission statement for our, for our committee. It's just simply to enhance the economic and national security of America. Now, the reason I thought it was so vital for our committee is, you know, I, I go around Wisconsin, uh, quite, quite honestly, go around America with uh, my little PowerPoint presentation. It ruins people's day. <laughs> it, is, it, it is not. Because it's, it's telling people the truth. It's telling people the reality that we just are refusing to face. But I did this in front of the, the Madison, Wisconsin Rotary. Now, for anybody familiar with the, the Wisconsin Madison, it would not be called, called a bastion of, uh, of conservatism. <laughs> so, you know, I, I get there, there's probably about 300 people in the audience around, sitting around tables, and about two thirds of them are like this. Uh, oh, man, I got I to gotta break the ice. So I decided to break the ice the way I would normally start any kind of business negotiation or, or business relationship. Now, I wouldn't start those with an argument. I would always start every negotiation trying to figure out everything we agreed on. It developed a relationship, a level of trust, so that when you came to those areas of disagreement, it was just a whole lot easier finding common ground. So that day I said, well, let's, let's start today before I ruin your day. But let's talk about something we agree on. We all share the same goal. We all want a prosperous, a safe, and secure America. We're concerned about each other. We all want every American to have the opportunity to build a good life for themselves or family. I, I don't care where you fall on the political spectrum. I think that's true. And it was interesting just watching the audience. Probably about half of those, those individuals with their arms crossed let them drop by the side and were at least open to listening to me. And so, I realized, gee, this, this worked in business, it actually worked in the political realm. So when I had this opportunity, and it's a tremendous opportunity, it's a tremendous responsibility being chairman of Homeland Security and Government Affairs, I thought I'd take that same technique. Let's, let's not concentrate on the areas that divide us. Let's try and concentrate on the things we agree on, starting with that shared purpose, that shared goal. So if everything the committee does, if I can always, now, this bill you're proposing, or, or this hearing you want, is, is it going to help us enhance the economic and national security of America? Helps direct people's effort. When we held our first business meeting, we had that laid out, we've also listed just some initial priorities. But the aspirational goal, I, I, I stated at the, at the first business meeting where we you know, vote on our rules and our budget, I said, listen, yeah, I, I think everybody around this table Democrat and Republican center alike came here to do something. You know, well intentioned. Represent your constituents. Well, the reality, and again, I'm big on the reality. The reality of the situation, if you're going to do something as a United States Senator, you have to pass some bills through the Senate. Now, in today's Senate, that means we need 54 Republicans and at least six Democrats <coughs> to overcome the 60 vote threshold. So the aspirational goal I set for our committee is let's concentrate on, on a piece of legislation where we have the support of all six or seven of our Democrat senators. Why not? And we have such a phenomenal opportunity. On the governmental affairs part of our committee, I mean, we, we set up two subcommittees, one on regulatory reform, one on trying to eliminate, eliminate duplicated programs, waste fraud against the federal government. But Tom Carper is my ranking member, man of integrity. He wants a lot bigger government than I want. But he does, you know, whatever government he has, he wants it to be effective, efficient, not waste the taxpayer's money. Okay, so we, we can find, you know, all kinds of areas of agreement there. Regulatory reform? I mean, come on, there's got to be thousands, I mean literally thousands of regulations that are hampering the ability of business organizations or nonprofit organizations, even in blue states, from being able to expand and create the kind of jobs, the kind of opportunities that, again, we all want to create for American population. So rather than concentrating the areas of disagreement, I just ask the committee members, you know, bring those, those regulations that need reforming or modernization, 
or just outright elimination. And things that, you know, reforms that aren't going to violate your principles and won't violate mine, we can pass with unanimous consent. We actually had a markup yesterday. We, we reported out nine bills that hopefully can just get passed with unanimous consent because nobody's objecting to them. They're, they're not huge gains, but they're marginal gains. They're steps in the right direction. And, and you can start that process. I, I just have a belief that maybe it'll build upon itself. And maybe, maybe they'll see what happens in our committee, and maybe that it might expand to other committees. And maybe in the next two years, even though if you're kind of noticing the Democrats are trying to do everything they can to block us from having any kind of success whatsoever, you know, maybe enough Democrats will, will start realizing, you know, I, I kind of like to get one of my pieces of legislation passed. Maybe we can do this in my committee. So again, that, that's kind of my approach on, on the Homeland Security part of the committee. Our initial priorities, you know, first and foremost, we have to secure a border. We have to take a look at immigration law and eliminate or at least drastically reduce the incentives for illegal immigration that, that are you know, embodied in, in our immigration law. So take, take a look at that, then enforce that law. Do, do what we can to provide better border security. Um, cyber security is it's a priority of, the, of this president. Um, I hope that we can bring that across the finish line, you know, pretty modest proposal, just that first step, some information sharing that's going to require strong enough liability protection so that the chief counsels of major corporations, when they see that liability protection that's embodied in the bill, they'll actually advise their CEO that, yeah, in this instance we should share the information and we're protected. Uh, we need to protect our critical infrastructure, our electrical grid from both cyber attack as well as potentially terrorist attack. You know, we saw that, uh, that transformer you know, get shot up in, I think it was Met Metcalf, California. That's a little alarming. You know, we, we need to protect that. And then my final priority for Homeland Security is maybe a little unusual, but uh, this is something I truly believe in because I think uh, Secretary Jay Johnson's a good man. And I think he believes in his mission. And he's pursuing trying to keep this nation safe. So my, my final priority was doing everything we can as a committee to help Jay Johnson the Secretary of Homeland Security succeed in his mission. And, and part of that is to kind of streamline his, his reporting authorities to Congress because it's, you know, 22 agencies cobbled together. They've got, I think it's like 70 some committees they have to report to. So I'd rather have Jay Johns concentrating on keeping this nation safe. Uh, he's got to report to Congress. Uh, congressional oversight is important, but, you know, there's an appropriate level and an inappropriate level right now with that inappropriate level. But with that, that's kind of what, you know, kind of the game plan here, how, how I'm trying to approach the committee, and uh, it's how I always approach business, how I'll, I'll continue to approach my, my time here in the Senate. With that, uh, happy to answer any question. Everything's fair game. Chris, you did such a great job with your intro. You have the ability to ask the first or wait till the last question. I'll take the last. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Rick Kessler. Senator, you talked about bringing business principles to government. We've all seen, because of technology, the cost goes down. And we've seen that immensely in cybersecurity, especially. How does the government stay up with all of these advances in technology and not get bound into, you know, when Big Blue owned everything, they, none of the little companies could come in. Now we're seeing the same thing in government stuck with companies that are providing technology that's 10 years old for cybersecurity. We can't get the <coughs> government to recognize the cost and effectiveness of new technologies. They're just so much better, but they can't get in. To give you a little hope, I did meet with pretty much all the agency heads within DHS, and, and in so many cases, they were talking about looking at off-the-shelf technology. And, and that's a good thing. You know, one, of, one of the problems we've got is, you know, we've got layer upon layer upon layer of procurement procedure, you know, making sure that we don't waste a dime, you know, that you know, no, nothing is, you know, fraudulently paid out to anybody. Um, and listen, I'm, I'm all for financial controls, but you know, you've got 10 or 12 layers of financial controls, I mean, it's such a huge waste of money, any potential savings is just, you know, totally blown in just the cost of, of these procedures. So. You know, from, from my standpoint, uh, what you do in business, of course, you, you do institute financial controls, but you give people responsibility, and you reward people for performance. Now, that's a pretty heavy lift in, in government, but it's the direction we need to take. 
uh, we do need people, particularly on the IT side, throughout all of government, really looking at off-the-shelf solutions as much as possible. Uh, you know, listen, I, listen, I was in the private sector. I, I've seen a lot of uh, material resource planning, uh, big installations, you know, three, four, five million dollars, you know, spent and then scrapped. So this is this you know this phenomenon is not just uh, isolated to government, but the beauty of of information technology, the beauty of computing is it does make things so incredibly efficient and, and the gains just build upon themselves. Uh, and we just don't take advantage of that in government. Uh, having more people from the private sector coming to government would be very helpful. We've got pay restrictions, uh, which is a problem. Uh, I have to admit, you know, coming from the private sector, uh, being a limited government kind of guy, I'm, I'm generally pretty impressed with the quality of the federal workforce. I have to admit, these are some pretty dedicated individuals, very smart people. Uh, they probably earn a whole lot more money on the outside, uh, but they choose to serve this, this nation. So there, there's, there's a base of good people there. Uh, I think it would give people the management flexibility. Uh, if we start you know, through reforms, and it's something really our, our, our committee is, is really dedicated to. You know, Claire McCaskill has been you know, just a bulldog in terms of uh, contract reform, that type of stuff. And that, that's a good thing. We've got a lot of members on this committee really looking, because the tradition of the committee has been very bipartisan, but re really honed in on some of these good government types of reforms, and that's what it's going to take. I mean, we really have to remove a lot of these layers of, of all these controls that really are, are self-defeating. Sir, um, Senator, uh, how do you see the, the the relationship with Europe, the cooperation um, on, on the question that you just raised? I have another question. Uh, how are we going to push back on Russia? Well, because because of Vladimir Putin's aggression, because of Charlie Hebdo, and what happened in Copenhagen, the, the relationship's actually strengthening. Um, Last year, every time we'd have a European delegation come in to uh, Chris Murphy, who was the chairman of the European subcommittee back then, now I'm chairman of that European subcommittee, the first you know, half hour discussion was about Ed Snowden, okay? They don't talk about that anymore. Now, now they actually start realizing that we really do need an effective intelligence gathering capability. I always say married with very robust congressional oversight, continuous monitoring, okay? Um, so I, they, they recognize that, that we are in this thing together. What we need to do with Putin is, you know, take the first step in, in any problem-solving process, acknowledge reality. Um, and we haven't done that yet. You know, I think the, the Europeans are denying reality. Uh, it, it, is, it is about appeasement. Uh, they're afraid that, uh, boy, if we introduce arms, it's just going to, you know, create an arms race and, and Russia will, will always trump us. We held, held a very good hearing in our subcommittee yesterday, and we had uh, uh, former Georgia President Chakasvili, who's actually working as an advisor in Ukraine. We had Gary Kasparov. We had some, some uh, experts from the Atlantic Council, some other folks. Uh, that, that basically said, no, we've got to provide lethal defense and weaponry. We have to change Putin's calculus. We have to drive the cost up. And I think one of the more powerful uh, stories that indicates that would actually work is what happened in Georgia. You know, Russia invaded. and. You know, to cut to a really short, simple explanation is we flew some C-130s in there. Uh, they had no idea it was in there. We made the commitment we were going to return uh, troops, you know, uh, Georgian troops back from Afghanistan and Iraq, and Vladimir Putin stopped. So the fact that we didn't, when Prime Minister Yatsenyuk came here, uh, he didn't directly ask because he was going to ask for something that he knew was going to be turned down, but basically asking for help and support, small arms, ammunition. We should have done that immediately. We should have upped the ante. We should have given defensive anti-tank weaponry to show Vladimir Putin that if he came across into, into Ukraine, he was going to pay a very heavy price. Now, what was a real shame is the Ukrainian army was, was hollowed out. But even that hollowed out military, because of the courage of the people, they, they, they had turned the tide. They were winning that. And the testimony we had yesterday, Russia, Russia, it's estimated, has somewhere between 14 and 20,000 troops in Ukraine. You know, totally denying it. Oh, we're not involved in this at all. What was that? That Buk, uh, uh, any aircraft weaponry shot down the Malaysian air flight? Anybody outraged about that anymore? Anybody, anybody thinking about that? So again, what we try to do is lay out the timeline. What's, what's really frightening about Vladimir Putin is, is if you lay out the, the timeline from when he first took over the FSB and then you know, his reign, 
There have been 29 political assassinations in Russia, largely unsolved, 29. The most recent one of a, a very brave individual, Boris Nepsov, right outside the Kremlin. You I mean, think about that. Somebody that high profile, a, a former deputy prime minister of Ukraine, gunned down in probably the most highly surveilled area in Russia, blatantly, brazenly. And somehow, I, I just got a feeling that they'll never solve that crime. So we, we need to understand Vladimir Putin for who, who he is. He is not looking for off-ramps. He's biding his time. He's very strategic. You know, enters these peace agreements so he can consolidate his gains as he's looking for another off-ramp, or another on-ramp. And my concern is his next on-ramp will challenge NATO, challenge Article 5. And that'd be very dangerous. So we better, we better stand up now, uh, remarkably. We unanimously passed in Congress an authorization, a dollar denominated authorization to pay for lethal defensive weaponry for Ukraine last year. And this administration refuses to take us up on that, on that offer. And it, it's a real tragedy. But again, but so yes, we need, to sh we need to match military strength with military resolve. We're not, we're not going to solve this through, through economic sanctions. I mean, Putin doesn't care. Sir? On the immigration <coughs> front, uh, what can be done this year or this Congress to maybe tighten the borders or cut back on benefits and things that make it less desirable for people to come across the border? What I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and cut through all the demagoguery on both sides. And, you know, Brooke is, is working closely with me. She, she had, uh, took a trip with me down to McAllen, Texas. I've been down to Nogales. I've been across the border on business. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, is there's demagoguery on this immigration border security on both sides. And it's an incredibly complex situation. Uh, there's no simple solution. There's no silver bullet. Uh, this is just going to be a really tough, hard slog, but we have to recognize reality. And we have to look at reality across the board. So we do have to take a look at, you know, what, what do we have in law, for example, the Feinstein Amendment, that treats you know, illegal immigrants that aren't from Mexico or Canada differently from, from other illegal immigrants, which creates a real incentive for people to come here, because that's really, and then, then you combine that with Deferred Action and Childhood Admissions, which basically said, hey, you send kids from Central America, if you get in here, you, know, you can stay. You're home free. And that's been basically the reality. Now, we had a surge of Brazilian immigrants back in the, I think it was 2006, and Michael Chertoff at that time sent them home. And that surge of illegal immigrants from Brazil stopped. It ended. Now, now we're a nation of immigrants. You know, that is what has made this country strong. But it has to be a legal process, and it has to be controlled. I mean, there are literally hundreds of millions of people. I don't blame them. I'd come here too. I'd come here legally if I had to. So I, 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 don't, I don't fault the people in their desire to be free and to have economic opportunity. But it's got to be a legal system. So it's a combination. We're probably going to have to build some fencing. I, I'm, not as, I'm not as high on a lot of this technology because a current law, and we, we can detect them. We don't detect all of them, but we detect, detect more of them now. We don't apprehend all we detect. So a lot of people slip through, but what we the people we apprehend, you know, it's, the CBP is uh, Customs and Border Protection. It really ought to be Customs and Border Processing. Because what's happening now is we, we apprehend them, we process them, you know, we, we, we give them a notice to appear and a bus ticket or plane ticket, and whoosh, they disappear in the shadows. So we're just exacerbating the problems. So we, we've got to tighten up our laws. Uh, we, we, we're going to have to take a look at, uh, you know, e-verify, and, and you know, but we also have to recognize the fact of, you know, who's here now, treat those folks with humanity, understand that there are industries that, let's face it, are pr pretty dependent on, on a lot of these folks, and we have to look at that realistically too, and that's, you know, politically, pr pretty tough issue to talk about. So what, what, I, what we're trying to do is rather than have two or three hearings, what, what I was suggesting is we're going to have to have three or four weeks worth of hearings, and about three or four hearings a week. Now, people say, well, that's not, that's not the way it's done. Well, it's, it's the way we're going to do it. And, I, I, you know, from my standpoint, I'd love to have a lot of senators come to those hearings, but it's almost beside the point. 
You know, we need to lay out all the complexity. We have to lay out all the components, all the reality of, you know, what, what is wrong with our border, you know, the nexus between drug smuggling and you know, human trafficking and illegal, illegal immigration. And we got a secure border, not only to fix the immigration problem because of public health and safety, and also because of uh, national security. I mean, are you starting to understand the complexity of the situation? So this is, you know, I, I know we approach so many of these things with, with, with ready sound bites. They're not solved by ready sound bites. They're, they're solved, you know, looking at an incredibly complex situation where we don't have very good information, and we're going to have to make marginal improvements. I come from a manufacturing background. <coughs> this isn't about securing the border in a year or two. This is about improving border security. And from my standpoint, working with somebody who I think is, again, an honorable human being, Jay Johnson, he, he's, he's developing a plan with Coast Guard. Let's, let's work off that plan. Let's see what we can do. You know, there will be some disagreements. You know, let's face it, President Obama has done some of these deferred actions that I think exacerbate the problem. So it certainly was, by the way, did poison the well. Because after I got elected, I started talking about this is my top priority, securing the border. I was always throwing a little wrinkle as I went on national news media saying, you know, if you really want to secure the border, again, you have to look at these incentives for illegal immigration. What's the number one incentive? People are coming here to work. About 90% is what studies tell us, about 90%. Well, why don't we make that a legal process? When we had the Pacero program back in the 60s, we didn't have an illegal immigration problem, not a significant one. And we had, we had circularity, by the way. People could come in, <coughs> work, and go home. They'd come in, they'd go home. But the minute you, you end that guest worker program, the minute we started securing our border, it made it more difficult. Now people get in here once and they stay. So it, again, we have to take a look at the reality of the situation. We have to take a look at the unintended consequences of past actions. We really need to take a look at the futility of what we've done for the last 40 years. So this is going to require a lot of thought. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to have a bill next week or in a month. And we'll start, we'll start working toward that. I mean, we already have elements of what we need, need to address, but that's why we need to hold hearings so we can make intelligent decisions. And I, I really would like every member of Congress to take the crab to both. First, do no harm. And it's certainly kind of my approach to things. I'm going to really try not to do any harm. Really take a look at the unintended consequences of anything we might propose. But again, if I lay out that reality and if I can get the goal, and Kirk is well aware of this because I, I repeat myself a lot. The goal of every hearing, every hearing I hold, first and foremost, is to get the, at least the members of the committee, if not America, to take the first step in any problem solving pro problem is admit they have one. And of course, you get people to admit they have a problem by laying out the reality, by properly defining the problem. So that's what we're going to try and do through a series, you know, probably way more hearings than uh, Brooke is going to want to have to uh, really staff, but uh, it's, 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 it's an enormous undertaking. I mean, I, I have to admit, I was, we went down the border together in McAllen, and I just wasn't in a very good mood the next, you know, that night, because it's just, uh, this is so complex, this is going to be so difficult. That's just true. But we got to be honest with the American public. Anybody else? Senator, let, let me ask you, you know, recently, you know, with the DHS funding, there's been these high expectations with the House and the Senate both now going Republican, that we were going to do it better at looking at some of the issues that are going to be coming forward in the next three, four, five, six months, whether it be the Highway Trust Fund, reconciliation, um, all sorts of other regulations that we're going to be looking at. Do you see light at the end of the tunnel that we are, in fact, going to do it better? Well, I laid out my approach to trying to do it better. But, yeah, <laughs> and you as a businessman, you really understand that. So, but look at the, so again, look at the reality situation. I mean, look at what Democrats in the Senate have been doing, you know, for the last four years, not even allowing us to vote on amendments. They're shutting down the Senate as a deliver body. Now in the minority, even though we're going to offer them amendments, they still <laughs> wouldn't allow us four, four times. We tried to just bring a bill on the floor to fund DHS to find that common ground, to find some compromise. And trust me, within the conference, there are all kinds of different compromises that we were talking about ourselves if we just get a bill on the floor and start offering amendments, but they denied that. So, yeah, I think it's pretty obvious the Democrats, you know, as, as, as a party, as a group, you know, particularly things that are on the floor, they're going to try and deny us most success. 
which is why I'm really trying to find the, the smaller things that mm -hmm. everybody agrees on that we can pass unanimous consent that will make a big deal out of it, hopefully, okay? So I, I think that's got to be our approach. We also have to recognize the reality is that President Obama is still president. And it's going to be, even if we can get six Democrats to pass a bill in the Senate, we'll have to have 67 total to override his veto. So it's just going to be tough. But, you know, what I've always, what I've been saying since day one is how do we, how do we use the House strategically? Because that, that, that's a majority-run body, and if we ran this strategically to show the American public this is what we're for, and by the way, it should be all about security, economic security and national security. And this is where I say less is more. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense for the House to pass 400 bills that don't have a chance to get through the United States Senate. So let's, let's concentrate on a few things that we have to do, and from my standpoint, it's let's pass a budget, <laughs> So we've got a reconciled budget that will govern the appropriation process. And let's start bringing the most important, the higher priority appropriation bills. Let's bring those to the floor of the Senate, open up to full amendments, full debate, and let's show the American people how this lawmaking process is supposed to work. Let the House do its work, let the Senate do its work, then let's bring those two products together in a conference, hammer out the differences, and put it on the President's desk. So and that's really what I think Mitch McConnell's been dedicated to. He's been frustrated, obviously, by Democrats, but we need to do that. That's why, about, you know, saying everything else aside, at this point in time, it's about passing a budget we can reconcile with the House so we can move on to appropriation bills, do as many of those things as possible. Sir? I was um, to take your analogy and take it one more level. When you're talking about these massive hearings, it creates a big mass that becomes almost impenetrable to any, anyone who wasn't actively involved in creating the record. Which makes it easy to hide and harder, harder to push. Uh, and you talk about marginal change. Why don't we do it one tile at a time to create the mosaic? Tiny little bills. Yeah. Marginal change. And that, that, that's, that's what we just did in our committee. We, we reported out nine tiny little bills that start moving forward. And, and even the hearings I'm talking about is have, rather than have one massive, okay, here's, here's our border security hearing. No, we're going to have, you know, literally, I, I won't say dozens, I don't want to scare the bro. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to have a lot of them. And, and they're, they're going to take the individual components, and, and they do have value, by the way, because hearings are reported on, and they're reported on, you know, particularly in the press. The, you know, is specialized in that particular area. And if you design them properly, in terms of, you know, I'm a sales guy. You know, when, I, when I'm going to any customer, there's always one point I wanted to make. I always had two or three in my back pocket, you know, if I, but I had to make that first point. So we go in these hearings, and from my standpoint, there's always one point that I want to reveal. We, we had a hearing on regulatory reform. I don't think I made the point well enough, we'll probably do it again. But the main point I want to make on regulatory reform is the cost of complying with federal regulations. And there are a number of studies showing it's about $2 trillion. You know, okay, I kind of go, okay, $2 trillion. It's incomprehensible. Well, you put it, start putting it in perspective. $2 trillion is larger than all the 10 economies in the world. Now, we, we did make that point. Uh, $2 trillion is, you know, 12% of our $17 trillion economy. But, but here's something maybe even more impactful. We spent about $2.5 trillion on our healthcare system. And we're spending $2 trillion complying with federal regulations. Now, that's, you know, that's real economic activity. Now, if we could reduce the regulatory burden, that could free up a trillion dollars we could spend on healthcare as a society, you know, hopefully in the free market system. So again, you're trying to make those powerful points to get people to admit they have a problem, recognize the depth of it, so they actually start moving towards some solutions. But no, I agree with you. It's, it's got to be smaller points. This is, you know, I, I wish we would just wipe. Here'd be a good law. Outlaw the use of comprehensive in, in Washington, D.C. You know? Ban letters from the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, I was actually down uh, at an FBI office, and, and they were throwing all kinds of acronyms. And, and I said, God help me. I'm starting to understand what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Go ahead Fred. Oh, uh, Senator, cybersecurity is such a broad issue that many committees have a jurisdiction complaint to it, both the House and the Senate. Uh, we've heard some thoughts about how the uh, 
Homeland Security uh, Committee will see its role in that, but maybe you could tell us afresh sure. and what you think the timetable is on cybersecurity. Well, the current play is, is you know, Saxby Channels is working with Diane Feinstein had a, had a bill that uh, had, you know, a number of components to it. And then uh, they were never, never able to get that, uh, you know, considered uh, in the last Congress. And so Richard Burr is taking up where uh, Saxby left off, and they have an agreement between he and Diane Feinstein. Uh, again, it's, it's a little more ambitious bill, and certainly more than what the, the White House was seeking. So I, I don't know the current state of play that I'd, I'd like to be supportive of, because I think it's a good bill. But but if, if we can't bring that one across the finish line, if because it might involve a little bit more of, in, of in some of the intelligence agencies or whatever, or that it just comes out of the intel community. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons people that don't really want to see this can you know, raise a ruckus about it. Uh, if, if for whatever reason that one just is not possible, uh, Senator Carper has introduced in our committee, and this would be under our jurisdiction, President Obama's more modest bill, uh, really addressing that first step. Which, I mean, maybe, maybe that's all we can do, but it'd be an important first step is facilitate the information share. Now, when, when Secretary Johnson called me to kind of announce the bill, he said, you know, I was questioning about the liability protection. He said, no, Ron, it is unqualified. You know, I, it's unqualified. Well, it's unqualified as long as you qualify for it. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but I, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that uh, like an ISO process, you know, rather, rather than have the federal government you know, set the standards, which would you know take them seven years to, to write the standards on the qualification. Um, they're they're actually talking about a third party, which I don't think I'd have a real problem with. I mean, like an ISO, you could you can go under you know we have surveillance audits. I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm ISO certified as my business, and you have these surveillance audits. The, the standards are always improving. It's continuous improvement. There's nothing wrong with that. So if you have an outside third party private sector certifier of best practices of your business, so you know so you're certified. You know, by this third-party outside private sector group, you know, then then apparently it's it's unqualified liability protection. Now, the, the way I'm going to test that theory is because I'm no attorney, I, I haven't been involved in these disputes. So what, what I've now I've actually talked to somebody from uh, I won't name companies, <laughs> but uh, what I need to do is I need to line up the chief counsels, respected chief counsels of respected businesses across the the, the industry sectors, you know, finance and, and retail and critical infrastructure, you know, and get them up in front of a hearing with this bill, with this language, and say, okay, now, in, in a moment of data breach, based on this language, is this sufficient liability protection that your advice to your CEO is that you're going to share that information and have that be the acid test? Hopefully, it'll be unanimous and go, absolutely. If it's absolutely not, well, we've got to go back to work. And I, I wouldn't move a bill forward, but that's the reaction. So again, a pretty, pretty practical approach to this, right? Because that's the acid test. I mean, I, why do an information sharing bill in name only? Well, let's actually pass a bill that will facilitate, uh, induce private sector sharing. And that would be an important first step. It's not a panacea. It's not going to solve cybersecurity, but it will help prevent a lot of attacks. You know, because you can share it quickly, you send out those, those threatening signatures, and, and you're protecting people. Now, the next step would be using information so you can go after the criminals. And that's, that's where it starts to become a little bit more of a sticky wicket where you need some personal information, IP addresses, that kind of stuff. Um, maybe that's the next step. Let's, let's build some confidence, you know, kind of step by step, you know, piece of me. I'm, I'm happy to make the incremental gains. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, you have them. So that was a lot of my question, but I'll just work off of that a little bit. Um, very supportive of the liability protections that you mentioned before. Cybersecurity in the past has been this kind of large, package that tends to kind of collapse under its own weight because mostly of the way the jurisdiction is spread across so many committees. How do we kind of get towards that end goal of, I guess, pushing through the package that uh, Senator Burr is working on now that is just that kind of necessary incremental step without having too many cooks in the kitchen and having the entire thing kind of right. fail? Well, again, I, I want to be fully supportive of what Richard Burr is doing in the Intel Committee. I'd like to get that one across the line, but you know, let's be real, realistic, it'll be a challenge. And so if that doesn't work, that's why, you know, you bring it to Homeland Security then, and we start with the President's bill. I mean, just like, cyber, just like border security. You know, rather than ignore the administration, rather than ignore Secretary Johnson, no, I want, to, I want to work hand in glove. And this is where I'm hopeful, because President Obama in his State of the Union address said this is a priority. He recognized it, you know, because 
public's aware of this. They're seeing the potential danger. E even, by the way, our, and we had a, a hearing on this. This was our first hearing. And the privacy advocate, the Democratic witness, which a uh, ve very good person, I really, really commend uh, Chairman Carper for, for picking this guy, was willing to acknowledge that, you know, what really puts America's privacy at risk more are the cyber attacks themselves. I mean, if you're concerned about privacy, let's do something about trying to prevent some attacks. So yeah. there's a willingness to work with us. And so that's what I'm saying. If, you know, if, if the Intel bill just has too much in it and just can't cross the finish line, you know, that's, that's where I think we really step up the plate. And we take a look at President Obama's uh, offering. Take a look at some elements of the Intel bill that may, maybe had kind of some unanimous support that would, that would strengthen the bill. Take a look at those liability protections and possibly get across the finish line that way. Let, let me make one other comment, though, about the, the attitude around here, because I was, you were talking about that first massive bill, which was the Collins-Lieberman, where everybody said, you gotta do, you gotta do cybersecurity. Well, we have a hearing in DHS, the people are gonna be, you know, uh, charged with writing all these regulations. I mean, in the hearing, that's where it came up seven years, I, I asked them, how long is it gonna take you to, to write all these rules and regulations? They asked me about seven years. So, well, you know, the internet, internet will be reinvented by that point in time. Yeah. Um, so again, this is why it's got to be a lot more nimble. The other point I'd make is the attitude of far too many lawmakers. I, I was in the, the sausage making room when it was kind of down to crunch time, and you know, it's, we got we got the cybersecurity. Now that ought to scare you right there. You got a bunch, of, you got a bunch of U.S. senators hammering out the details of a cybersecurity bill. I mean, that's, you know. <laughs> Some, some of them don't know how to email. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the point I'm making is the attitude. Now, I'm, I'm the lone guy in the room going, guys, gals, businesses actually want to protect their cyber assets. Just like you want to protect your worker safety, you want, you want to make sure your airplanes don't fall out of the sky. I mean, you know, the, you know, it's bad for business, okay? So if we facilitate, if we facilitate the, the sharing of information, if we facilitate you know, private sector working with government, because they recognize the government's got some real things to offer here. If we facilitate that rather than dictate it, we have a shot. If we dictate it, and, and the pushback was actually, I was amazed by it. No, no, you're wrong. We've got to do this. They don't want to do this. We have, they have to be forced. Uh, it's an attitude that uh, we have to overcome. Thank you, Senator. Um, in your jurisdiction on regulatory review, you I don't want to speak for all my colleagues, but I think it's true that probably every Republican, every elected member of Congress here would repeal Dodd-Frank. We would certainly repeal and get rid of CF, CFPB, okay? Um, I don't have jurisdiction over it, but what I do have jurisdiction over is hold hearings of some of the abuse. And that's probably something we, we're, we're happy to do. And that's, that's something, if, if there's some specific abuses that you know, need to be highlighted, yeah, it's, it's what I can do now. I, I, I get to select what hearings we're going to hold. And the hearings are designed to, again, highlight a problem, lay out reality, so that hopefully at least you know, our committee recognizes we got a problem. And it's a problem, in, and the CFPB is going to do so much harm to our economy. They're, they're going to just add to that $2 trillion of regulatory burden in a massive way. So you know, we're, we're on your side. Um, you got to get the other folks on your side, OK? I think I'm getting the hook. Well, one last question, Senator. Talk to us about uh, your favorite governor and his chances uh, going forward. Sure. Now, I think Governor Walker is, and you're starting to see it right now, is, is pretty well positioned, partly because uh, Charles Krautkammer came and spoke at, uh, at uh, the Bradley Foundation in Kohler. And he started a speech saying, you know, I just hear Minnesota nice. So I think Wisconsin even nicer. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm originally from Minnesota, Minnesota nice, and then you move over to Wisconsin, and Wisconsin are just down to earth folks. <coughs> And so, you know, I'm, I'm hoping what you see from people like Paul Ryan and, and Ryan's Priebus and, and Governor Walker is, is, is a pretty moderate tone. You know, I may be very conservative in our views, but we speak in a pretty moderate tone. It's, it's, it's who we are. It's, it's, it's not fake. It's just who we are. In my election, you know, this is during the whole Tea Party revolt, 
you know, there were states during 2010 where you had Tea Party establishment just butting heads. Not in Wisconsin. There, there wasn't even a crack of light between really what the Tea Party was trying to do and what the Republican Party was trying to do. It was just kind of one melded group, and that's still the truth. So where, where Scott's pretty well positioned, first of all, he did something. He accomplished something. He accomplished something pretty important. This was a fight in terms of uh, challenging the public sector unions, but what he really did is he gave the cities, the municipalities, where government really ought to be close to the governed, he gave them the flexibility to balance their own budgets. Okay, and the and the unions, you know, you know, stood up and screamed. You would not believe the viciousness. It, it has not been reported. The viciousness, the death threats, not just to the governor, but to, to men and female members of our legislature. It was just utterly vicious. But Scott Walker showed that courage, and that means something. I mean, it really does. I, I know he was criticized for a CPAC speech, but the point he was making, and I think it's a valid point, he withstood that. I mean, you had to be. You had to be there. I wasn't, but I was watching very carefully. Hundreds of, you know, hundred thousand people protesting, busting into our capital, death threats, and he had the courage of his convictions, like Ronald Reagan did with Patco. He stood firm, and that tells you something about the man. So Scott, because he did something, now it certainly has the support of of the conservatives, but again, because he's from Wisconsin, even nicer. <laughs> you know, he's, not, he's not a threat to, to the establishment, and again, because of that recall, the nation rallied around him. So across the country, support came in, and Scott met a lot of people around the country. So I mean, you just take a look at the sort of the natural, you know, what you have to do to be president. Well, you have to be nationally known. You have to have done something. You had to accomplish something. You had to show courage. And you also have to have a lot of people that are really supportive, that have met you, that, that realize, here's a good person. I mean, here's somebody that I want to consider. You know, you know, I'm not going to automatically dismiss this guy. I'm going to really give him serious consideration. So I think he's very well positioned out of the wall. We'll all see how it comes out. I'm going to support whoever is a Republican candidate. But you know, this is just you know, my own personal evaluation in terms of why you're seeing Scott Walker right now in a pretty good position. And he may remain in that position because I think he's just, again, it's, it's just a very, very good blend of conservative accomplishment, courage, and an appeal to the establishment. Okay. Thank Senator, you you've been so...